We now have the national anthem of Trinidad and Tobago, followed by a prayer with Senator Anita Haynes. prayers to you and seek your protection for everyone in our blessed country we pray O oh God for you to protect us from harm and sickness so that we may have the strength to look after one another O oh, merciful Lord we pray that you will continue to bless our land and those who cultivate our crops so that there may always be food we pray that no one will ever go hungry Grant us understanding, equal vision, and balanced minds. Guide us along a path of faith, devotion, and wisdom. Help us to recognize that each of us is equal, that we are all equal in humanity. Give us your protection so that we may live in safety together and grow strong and free together. We pray that everyone will find love and peace in their daily lives. Dear God, we pray for our political leader. We pray for members of this team. Protect them, God, and give them the strength and courage to continue their service to our nation without fear or favor. Thank you, God, for keeping your children free in our democratic state, where every creed and race finds an equal place. Dear God, we beseech you, to bless our leaders, bless our people, and bless our country. Candidate for Toko Sangre Grande, Miss Nabila Green. Good evening to my political leader and next Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Mistress Kamala Posad Visesa. A good evening, esteemed nationals of Trinidad and Tobago and a special good evening to members of my constituency and those who are viewing. My name is Nabila Sasha Green, and I hailed from the picturesque, scenic, salubrious village of Grand River, Toko. I am the proud candidate of the United National Congress for the beautiful yet largely unexplored constituency of Toko Sangre Grande. It is such a profound and distinct honor to be associated with the most vibrant, resourceful, and competent political party in Trinidad and Tobago, as we aim to rescue our beloved country from the clutches of an unscrupulous and insipid gang posing as government. My friends, we stand on the threshold of a phenomenal revolution which is sweeping over this country, in every home, in the minds of every citizen who is capable of telling the difference between a truth and a lie. And I want to emphatically declare that Toko Sangri Grande is willing, is capable, and poised 
to play an integral and instrumental role in realizing the dream of every rational thinker and install the United National Congress as the next government of Trinidad and Tobago. Everywhere I walk in this constituency, I have observed the social neglect, the infrastructural underdevelopment, the mismanagement of resources, the erosion of hope, and not only unemployment of our youth, but a redeployment of inept and failed policies, not even suited for an institution for the mentally deranged. It is no secret that I will work relentlessly and intelligently to rescue and restore the disempowered, disenfranchised, and vulnerable in our society. Both victims and perpetrators of domestic violence will receive relevant and appropriate support systems necessary for the emotional and psychological repair. Every child in this constituency will be assured an equal opportunity to develop holistically, and every drug addict and homeless resident will have a chance to be rehabilitated, removed from the streets, rejuvenated, and return as a useful, contributing, law-abiding citizen to Trinidad and Tobago. My fellow citizens, Toko Sangri Grandi has expansive areas of land capable of producing food crops and livestock to feed the nation and many other countries, thus reducing our food import bill significantly. This long overlooked developmental venture and a number of spins off industries in production, warehousing and marketing will provide thousands of jobs and ensure a much needed diversification of the economy. By the same token, we want to prevent the brain drain from our constituency and ensure the dignity of our residents by providing affordable homes for all our deserving people. We have the natural resources. Our database of skilled personnel in this constituency will be utilized to ensure that the employment of our constituents will be assured. New housing projects in Valencia, Sangre Grande, and Toco will be a priority for us as we aim to establish Toko Sangre Grande as one of the most developed regions in this country. Of course, these developments will attract business interests and investments to the region. Small and medium businesses will be encouraged and supported to be part of this exciting development. Our aim is to eradicate unemployment. The Toko region has a vast array of ecotourism, opportunities with a world-renowned leatherback turtle, the Pawi, the nature trails, and waterfalls which accessorize the environment and which provides endless opportunities for employment and foreign exchange. The hospitality industry there depends largely on the efficacy of the ecotourism factor. For decades, this progress and stability have been rudely impeded and obstructed by woods which are perennial states of disrepair. This wanton disregard for our dignity and our rights is disrespectful and atrocious. This is going to change. This must change, and this will change. In addition, this constituency has produced the second ever gold medalist, Keyshawn Walcott, and two international netballers, Samantha Wallace and Shaquanda Green, who happens to be my sister. And there are many other national sportsmen and women who deserve the right to harness and develop the enormous potential in sports which exists in this constituency. Therefore, a modern state-of-the-art sporting facility will be established in Sangre Grande or Valencia, and another facility at Kumana to ensure this development is realized. Finally, the once proud and high-profile Northeastern College has waned significantly in its input and output levels. To add insult to injury, the Toko Secondary School, which I happen to graduate from, has deteriorated to a painful eyesore, a relic of the past, slow poisoned by neglect and contempt for people of this constituency. This has led to a form of indifference and disillusionment among stakeholders in our education district, and this does not augur well for the region. I will work hard, as seriously that is, so that Northeastern College and Toko Secondary's restoration and resurgence as a model educational institution 
will bring back a much needed dimension in the new paradigm of development in Toko Sangi Grandi. I, Nabila Green, stand ready and committed and will work cohesively with all who share these ideals and philosophy of upliftment, liberation, and social development to ensure that these desirable outcomes are achieved. Come election day, vote for proper representation, vote for Nabila Green, vote for our next Prime Minister, Mistress Kamala Posad Bisesa. I thank you. It's me again. Live from the United National Congress virtual campaign on the ballot, the UNC candidate for San Fernando West, Senator Sean. Good evening to the Honorable Political Leader, Mrs. Kamla Prasad Vicesa of Senior Council. Honorable members of both Houses of Parliament, members of the National Executive, my San Fernando West family, and to all members of the UNC Work Nation Universe. We've gone past family now. This movement has gotten bigger than the globe itself. We are now the UNC Work Nation Universe. As we prepare for the upcoming general elections, the United National Congress continues to lead the way by staying connected with the citizens of our country through our virtual meetings. Tonight is no different, as our great party's efforts are always on display through our many social outreach programs and adhering to our political leader's mantra, pounding the pavement and touching the flesh. Our party continues to be the only political party as is being demonstrated here tonight, that has and continues to present plans for a nation's development. This is just one of the many valuable takeaways from tonight's virtual meeting, and I commend all the hardworking members of our party for their devotion to getting Trinidad and Tobago working again. Like many of my fellow constituents, as we continue to exist under the gaze of an unconcerned MP and government with no assistance forthcoming before, during, or even after the COVID-19 lockdown, I continue to empathize with all Southerners by this callous state of abandonment that continues to plague us. My friends, the reason for this horrendous situation has never been clearer. We have a rowley administration that is divorced from the people of this country. They are not in touch with our needs. They are not on the ground. And they are not turning their ears to hear the cries of the people. Citizens across Trinidad and Tobago are still reeling from the impact of COVID-19. Businesses have closed down. Jobs have been lost. And a sense of unease and uncertainty remains constantly in the air. While some people have gone back out to work, Many more are still at home awaiting relief grants that may never come. Families that were barely making ends meet are now relying entirely on charity and the generosity of strangers. Meanwhile, the government is turning the sod on mega construction projects and simultaneously proclaiming that we cannot afford to be a welfare state. Fortunately for the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, and the residents of San Fernando West, such occurrences are in direct contrast to the policies and the positions articulated by the United, United National Congress as mandated by a political leader. I take this opportunity to thank our volunteers and donors for stepping up where the government has failed. You heeded the call of the United National Congress, the call by our honorable leader to band together and support our fellow citizens. Thanks to you, we are still able to execute our food drives, distributing cooked meals as well as food hampers to families across San Fernando West and the nation as a whole. 
especially to families whose breadwinners cannot currently provide for their children. Children, our children, to our many children who are currently preparing to go back out to school for examinations during this period, while many of them are behind due to a lack of access to online learning, most of them continue to suffer from the increased mental and emotional stress of dealing with a pandemic. My message to you is hold fast. Believe in yourselves and you will be successful. What has the government done to address the very valid concerns of safety and well-being raised by parents and teachers? <laughs> well, believe it or not, their response to some lucky schools was to supply them with toilet paper and a few bottles of hand sanitizer with which to fight the coronavirus. This is the kind of approach that this government has adopted, which I could only describe in one word, unacceptable. As a responsible opposition and as true patriots, my team and I have been fortunate to help multiple schools in San Fernando embark upon private sanitization exercises and also to donate to much needed, much needed hygiene supplies, such as face masks and personal bottles of hand sanitizer. This will afford students and staff significant peace of mind while on the school's grounds as they can be sure of their safety. Ladies and gentlemen, the sun is rising on a new age of politics. The United National Congress is pioneering higher levels of inclusiveness and consultation, exactly what you the people have been asking for. From my walks through San Fernando West, from Marabella to Green Acres, one message has been consistent. The people are fed up with absenteeism in politics. They are fed up with representatives who are seen less often than a blue moon. And they are ready to let their voices be heard at the ballot box. That is what happened in the local government election. And it will happen again in the upcoming general elections. It is time for people-centered representation and policy development based upon consultation. It is time that constituents be able to access their elected representatives. It is time that our representatives advocate on our behalf and bring solutions to the issues that affect our day-to-day -day lives. It is time for real leadership. As the next member of parliament for San Fernando West, I look forward to advocating on behalf of residents to address their real issues. The effects of crime in our communities we all deserve to feel safe wherever we go. We will tackle criminal elements head on in surgical and clinical ways designed to reduce and hopefully eradicate criminality in a way that has never been seen before. The poor maintenance of our public facilities, recreation grounds and common spaces must be maintained if they are to serve the intended purpose. The many challenges facing our business sector will be addressed as businesses are struggling to stay afloat and entrepreneurship has taken a hit. The many declining job opportunities, we all know someone who has lost their job in recent times, and especially the residents of South Trinidad, who know that tale all too well with the closure of Petrotrin. We will engage our youth and promote sustainable development through jobs and sport, and educate our youth on the benefits of new and emerging careers which are often marginalized but have found their place on the global stage. We will promote affordable housing that will be accessible through auditing the current HDC system and weeding out corrupt practices where one person has two and three homes being rented out. Every citizen deserves a comfortable house that they can make a home. These are the topics of conversation that I'm currently engaged in when I meet and greet persons along my walkabouts. And these are some of the solutions that I have advanced through consultation with the citizens and our political leader. Most importantly, we want to bring back a sense of community in our neighborhoods. As MP, I intend to revamp our community centers. Community centers are not meant to be empty buildings behind locked gates only opening for the occasional reception upon paying a fee. They should be hubs of activity with programs specifically designed to serve the needs of the communities. 
in some communities that would look like a homework center with additional after school activities. For others, it can provide a safe space for mentoring and personal developmental programs. Trade and vocational skills that lead to job opportunities. That is what sustainable development looks like, and it should be available in all communities. Community centers should be dynamic spaces for congregation and community building. Together, we can make that happen. Together, under the guidance of our political leader, Mrs. Kamala Prasad Bisesa, we will return to people-centered politics with a government that cares for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And so, my friends, it is clear that if we want a change, then we have to change what we are doing in order to get a different result. To San Fernando West and all of Trinidad and Tobago, I say, out with the old and in with the new. Let us choose a brighter future for all. This election, the only choice is the United National Congress. Thank you and good night. Good night, Trinidad and Tobago. I bring greetings from the vibrant constituency of Point Fortin, from Ikakas to Cochrane, from Erin to Mahaika, New Village to Granville, Harriman Park to Tiche Village. Tonight, I encourage Point Fortin to enter government with me, because yes, God is our guide. The United National Congress is already going to be the next government under the leadership of Kamala Passad Bisesa. So point 14 has one choice to make, to move into government with Obika. As a member of parliament, I will commit to fight to ensure point 14 gets working again nationally. The United National Congress will create 50,000 jobs. What will that mean in Point Fortin? No less than 1,000 jobs for Point Fortin, sustainable jobs, 100 strategic businesses, which I will explain in my contribution tonight. And of course, for those of you listening in Point Fortin, not having title to land, not having rights to land, not having the opportunity to build a home and have a stake in Trinidad and Tobago, under the leadership of Kamla Passad Bisesa, you will benefit from the land for the landless program. So no more squatting and worrying about government under this PNM regime bulldozing your houses as they did their brother, our brothers and sisters across the border in Santa Flora. You will have a stake in your country, of course, under the UNC. Point 14 is the cultural capital of the Caribbean. We have the most road march winners from the mighty Duke to Naya George to the boss Iowa George to Super Blue to Fian Lions. Point 14, however, has a problem with a festival square. Point 14, however, has a problem with sporting facilities. Point 14 produced Jerim Richards. Point 14 produced Steve David in football. And of course, our contribution to the energy base of Trinidad and Tobago is a standout feature in this nation. Point 14 is my home. My father always reminds me that my navel string, as well as those of my two brothers, was buried on school road in Point 14. Physically, really, actually buried in that plot that we grew up on school road. I have also been fortunate to have a global education. And I 
have participated in the phase of finance, business development, tertiary education, but with the birth of my first child. My wife and I, we moved back from Port of Spain to Point Fortin to bring my wealth of knowledge and experience to contribute to my community. And that is why as the candidate and then your MP, I will fight for Point Fortin. I will fight for Point Fortin under the banner of the UNC, under the leadership of Kamala Prasad Bisesa. Point 14 needs a vision. Envision Point 14, reclaiming its pride after this government has callously taken away jobs from persons in the oil belt, taken away jobs, food from the tables of families in Point 14. Point 14, you will rise again. On my personal walks, meetings with residents, I spoke to Ms. Blackman and Gonzales, and I asked her, what does Point 14 have for you to grow, a young professional? She said her response was that there's lack of opportunity. And to make it, to make it, you must leave the area. The closure of Petrotrin and the resulting paltry salaries paid to workers has dealt a body blow to many families in Point 14. But we can reverse the neglect of five decades of PNM rule using the tools available in the National Transformational Plan of the United National Congress. Point 14 will get 1,000 sustainable jobs, at least 100 new strategic businesses, upgrade of educational facilities. Imagine this government callously closed down the Energy Skills Acquisition Center in Point 14, virtually downgraded GVC, and discarded the Chatham Youth Facility, which was important in agriculture and agribusiness. This is not a government that cares for Point 14. Under Kamala Prasad Bisesa, there was no MP in Point 14. She built the highway. There was no MP in Point 14. She started and put the process in place for this hospital that they want to claim, but God will strike anyone down for claiming what is not theirs. As God is our witness, you must give respect where it is due. If not for Kamla Prasad Bisesa, we would still be going in the area hospital that Shell left when they left our shores. So, without an MP, she did that. Without an MP, she regularized Ravin Ranch and Tisha Extension. Those persons living in those communities today can attest to that. So, you can imagine with an MP, who would us fight for Point 14? the magic that we can create in Point 14. But how will we achieve these 1,000 jobs? Because nationally, we will achieve 50,000 jobs. What does that mean in Point 14? The tech park that was gifted to this government by the Kamala Prasad Bissasalit government has remained empty. I've been speaking to the investors and the tenants of, those, of, of the park. They are saying that they are getting frustrated with approvals. We will make sure that there is seamless approval so that they can progress with their financing requirements. 300 jobs can be created at E-Tech Park. The highway to Cedrus will open up the entire constituency. And then, of course, the Cedrus Development Zone, creating a further set of hundreds of jobs down from Captiville all the way to Icarcus, connecting Buenos Aires and Coromandel and Granville and so on. And, of course, Investors are waiting for that day. The culture industry, dear to me, dear to my heart. Point 14 has the embarrassment of a car park in the borough as the festival square. We will fix that. A proper festival center is important in Point 14 to create those jobs. But strategic businesses, 100 of them, throughout my walks I've been identifying business budding entrepreneurs who can create three to five jobs, whether they be persons making liquors in their household and they may be able to add to their manufacturing process and employ three other persons. A barber can employ three more persons. A body shop person can broaden his enterprise and employ more persons. I'm start, I've started that training program today, the 2nd of July. And for those of you interested in joining on that, you can go on my Facebook page, Taharka Obika, and you can get the lessons there, when we are in government, we would not have to be scrambling to look for these entrepreneurs. We will have them at the ready so we can create these thousand jobs, sustainable jobs in Point 14. You ask yourself, post-COVID, 
What has Point 14 benefited? This government took $20 billion. How much did you get? Businesses in Point 14 lining up, waiting for relief. Four months after. Next week would be four months after the first confirmed case of COVID-19. How much money have the small and medium enterprise businesses in Point 14 and nationally received? Nothing. This government does not care about the small man. Persons waiting for salary relief, how much have you gotten? Now, this government also doesn't care about education in Point 40. Kamala Prasad Bissessa built Egypt government primary school. Chatham school was 95% complete. They kicked me out of the Senate for raising that question. And I was very decent in my manner of speech. However, when we get into government, Fani Village, Sidras Anglican, Granville RC, Chatham government, we will fix you. Of course, there are many items in the National Transformational Plan. I can't raise all of them in one 10-minute session. But point 14, will be, constituency will be the recipient when you add Kamla Prasad Bissessa's first term and this incoming term of the single largest investment outside of the energy sector in the history of the constituency under the leadership of Kamala Prasad Bissessa when you add the highway, the hospital, and the highway extension, the Cedras, as well as the economic zone. I want to say that 50,000 jobs nationally is achievable. 1,000 sustainable jobs in point 14 will be created with me as your MP and with Kamala Prasad Bissessa as the Prime Minister. Point 14 has one simple decision to make, to move into government with me. Move into government with Obika and the UNC. I thank you. Have a blessed night. She continues to raise the hard questions that strike right at the heart of our nation. Her legal background stands as a defense for social justice and equality for all. She exuberates statesmanship, ambition and a passion for progress. In these tough times, some are called to meet the share of our nation's challenges. Each time she is called, she discharges her duties with dignity and determination. Live from the United National Congress Social Space, on the ballot now, Senior Counsel. Good evening, everyone. I'm so proud tonight of my UNC family. You have heard three of our brilliant candidates, Nabila for Toko Sandy Grande, Sean Sober is San Fernando West, and then he's called himself a storyteller, Senator Tahaka for Point 14. And I am so energized when I listen to them, their plans, and some of the achievements that we had. I want to thank them for joining us tonight. I thank you for joining us on this virtual. And as I said before, we miss you, but we shall meet again very, very soon. So whilst we celebrate the vibrancy and the energy of the team that we are putting in place, I come tonight to you with a very troubled heart. And it is because the last few days have been very unsettling. They show us the levels of dissatisfaction disapproval with a very failed rowley regime. The circumstances which led to the unrest in the capital city over the last few days, these are being investigated by authorities and we must await the outcome of these investigations. I continue to encourage and respect 
to call upon you to respect each other. Let us maintain my call for peace at this time. And I want to make it very clear, the TTPS is not the enemy. We have to make that very clear. The TTPS is not the enemy. Let me ask you a question. If a bandit is trying to break into your home, come into your yard, whom are you going to call? Another bandit? You will call the police. And so we respect them. Yes, we agree there may be some rogue elements in the TTPS. However, we respect them, and we must give them that due respect. We must have law and order in the country. So the TTPS is not the enemy. The enemy is a rowley p &M. That is a real enemy, because they have failed our country, and they have failed our citizens. And you know why all of this is happening? We have an MIA prime minister missing in action. This is a man who comes every time and say, meet me on the pavement. And the day the people came down the hill on the pavement to meet him, he was nowhere to be found. And then when the media asked him about his comments on what was taking place, as I said before, the man got pip yesterday. He got pip, he couldn't answer. He had no words to say. You know, he has always been a coward, you know, with a very big mouth, he's a bully. He behaves like a 70-year-old child. He's always pretending to be the victim, trying to get sympathy. And again today, with his useless press conference, trying to get sympathy and blaming everyone, he's victim number one in Trinidad and Tobago. I listened in amazement, you know, to the Prime Minister today. Once again, blamed UNC, blamed Kamala. And in doing that, he failed to acknowledge the abject failure of his government. He, they have failed totally to lift these communities. And then this is what happens, as I say, when you take away the gate, when you take away the laptops, when you take away the preschools, when you take away training opportunities, you take away services of normal people to do what? To buy paintings, to build castles, to pay for a rental $20 million. Your friends and your financiers, when the ordinary people, you will not take care of. This is what happens, as I say. When you want to give people a food card and a tank of LPG gas on the eve of an election, hoping to bribe them to give them a vote when you have neglected them for the past almost five years. Look, you have been in charge for almost five years. Five years. After almost five years, over three, almost $300 billion dollars. Not million, you know, $300 billion. More citizens are struggling, struggling to survive than ever before. And what is his answer? More promises. More promises? Blame Kamala. You know, he blamed everyone in the opposition. This man even went back 16 years to 2004 when he was a member of the cabinet of the government to blame Wade Mark for what is happening today. It is so ludicrous and ridiculous. And here he comes now, at this twilight in his government, what he's coming to do, he promises to share borrowed money so that the people he's giving it to, they have to pay it back, you know. They have to pay that back. Bribing citizens again with promises and misinformation. In the last five years, almost, in, under his watch, our country has regressed by decades. But we know the truth, you know. There is a clear choice. There is a clear choice. You have something to compare. You have a five years under this man with his promises to bring more blame and promises to do programs, to do initiatives, to do projects. Having failed in five years, can he do it in another five years? The choice is very clear. Do we want more blame game? Do we want more corruption? Do we want more feeding at the trough for friends and family and financiers? Or do we want a team that has a proven track record? A proven track record, we've done it before, and we can do it again. But not only a track record, we have a master plan to transform the economy and to transform our nation. So we have the plan. We have a history of performance. What do they have? The blame game. I want us to remember that. And every time they come to speak with you, they come to campaign, remember, what is your plan? What have you done in the almost five years? and compare that, as I say, with our plan and what we did. What he comes now to do today, he comes to set up another committee, another committee, more bureaucracy, more nothing. 
That's just like his roadmap, recovery roadmap. A committee to review committees to talk and talk and mama guy with no clear lines of targets, no clear lines for implementation, just more hot air, more old talk. You know, he wants you to believe that he now find out that these areas are underserved. He's just found that out. It reminds me of when we brought the manifest with the Venezuelans coming here. When I had the press conference and he jumped to have one, when he said, oh, I'm now discovering that Mr. Whoever was in it. You remember that? He's now discovering that these people in these communities have not been served well by his government. Can you imagine that? Do you believe that? He takes us for fools, but the only fool in the room is not us. I will not say who it is, but he wants to take everybody else for a fool. And you know, he takes the loyalty of these communities for granted. The objective has always been to keep these communities in dependency syndrome, desperately needing the state. They have deliberately victimized their own constituencies. You know why? Take them for granted and feel they're loyal. Point 14, Taka has spoken about point 14. Spent this five years without the completion of the highway because of rowley bad mind because he takes point 14 for granted. La Bray and point 14, the rest of the Southwest Peninsula, has, they have collapsed because again, Rowley believes that they're so loyal. He takes them for granted and therefore it's a kind of reverse discrimination. And then he lied to us. Point 14, La Bray, Santa Flora, the whole of Point de Pere, the whole of the South has suffered because he lied to this country when he said, the government is not shutting down Petrotrin. And in case you were opening the fridge door, or maybe he said, in case you were closing the fridge door, I repeat, the government is not shutting down Petrotrin. Lied to this country. He has lied on numerous occasions. Why should we believe anything that he has to tell us now? And so the whole of the South has been crippled because of their actions and their policies in the same way. The whole of the North has been crippled, and when you look at it, the entire country has been crippled because of this failed and destructive Rowley regime. You know something? People all over Trinidad, they want jobs, that's what they want. They want jobs. They know that this government has removed over 100,000 jobs since they came into office. And do I ask you tonight, I ask you tonight, do you want more of that? Do you want another five years or more job losses? Because that is what PNM stands for, you know. People never matter. Poor never matter. That is to the PNM. And then we have the high value of a fellow called Faris Al Rental. I think these days he must be counting his value in Venezuelan bolivars. I saw today that the English High Court ruled that Maduro cannot get the Venezuelan gold that has been held in banks in England. Again, Maduro regime is an illegitimate regime, and we have stood by that all this time. So I say, you have Faris counting his boulevards, and I want you to remember something, you know, because of events taking place now in the silly season of election time. Faris is a third generation politician. Do you understand what that means? Third generation politician. And as I'm Sean mentioned, he's an absentee MP. So he's third generation, grandfather, mother, and now him. And I am saying he is a perfect case study in why we as a nation must reject dynastic politics, where people want to be elevated to political office, not because of their intelligence and their competence, because of the name that they carry from their families. And so I share that with you tonight. Whilst Rowley continues his blame gleam, blame mantra, he forms a committee, as I say, to address what is happening up in the north. And I ask him, you, now you're coming to start some kind of program. You have two months left. In the final months of it, come on, man, you can't be real. Fail for five years. You want to tell me in two months you can get things happening again. And to add salt to the open wound, the people of these committees continue to be met with arrogance. They met, they're meeting them with contempt from the persons they elected to take care of their needs. You saw all of this happening. Did you see any one of the MPs going into these communities? Maybe they don't want to get a wetting after the next wetting that they had with water being thrown on them. So instead of listening to the cries of people, 
We have a prime minister who just brushed off their concerns. They don't care about you. All they care about is making sure they take care of themselves. The friends, the family, the finances, the Ferris, and now Adi Jalen John Foster. I'll share with you his files on another time. People never matter. The poor never matter. That's what PNM means. You know, um, I worked with former Prime Minister Manning for many years. You could say what you want about Mr. Manning. Of course he was my political opponent, and so we were on different sides of the house. So you could say what you want. But with Rowley and Manning, or Manning and Rowley, it's like chalk and cheese. Chalk and cheese. Today I acknowledge the fourth anniversary of the death of former Prime Minister Manning, and indeed thank him for his service to our country. When you look at Rowley falling after Manning, shock, cheese, shock, cheese, shock. I may have said what I did with Mr. Manning, but he was always a gentleman, and I think he had a care in his heart for people. You can't say that about this Rowley regime. So whilst this is happening under this government, let me just remind you, because I think people forget Taka did mention a lot of it, the achievements, and I, I think that's something we have to make sure that all our speakers can get a copy of um, in terms of the achievements in each of the constituencies. And Taka was right. We didn't have a UNCMP down there, but we did not neglect that constituency, as we neglected no constituency in this country. Our development was across the board, throughout Trinidad and Tobago, and Tobago. And so the party that I lead, we recognize that in order to deal with crime, we have to deal with the root causes of crime. The poverty, the underprivileged, the lack of opportunities, all of these must be addressed. Under the government I led, we focus on education, on training, skills development, and creating sustainable jobs. I remind you, we built over 106 schools. Today, you go into the constituencies and you'll see schools are overgrown with bush. They just abandoned the schools, abandoned the schools. Mr. Rory, remember, I said it last week. We built schools in your constituency. We built in the, the, all the Dago Martins. We built everywhere. Tuck told us today about point fourteen. I could tell you of the schools we built everywhere in this country, over 106 schools with others on the drawing board. Yet you abandoned those schools, some of them very complete, almost complete. Look, you abandoned the University of the Western East South Campus. Why? Why did you do that? You abandoned a campus. You abandoned the Cuba Children's Hospital. It took a pandemic for you to open that hospital. And so what has this government done in the five years? Schools almost complete, left the bush. Laptop program scrapped. Gate closed. NESC closed. I could, I could go on and on but we will have to identify and itemize another day. Why are they doing this? Is it that they're just wicked? Or is it that they're incompetent? Or maybe it's a combination of both. They just do not care. People never matter. Poor never matters. Today, the Prime Minister and um, many members of the government, they talk about this bail bill. They think the bail bill is the answer to all the crime in the country. Listen, you cannot lock up everybody in the country. You have to have a holistic view in the fight against crime. How you have the deterrence, how you, have, um, how you prevent it in the first place, how you treat with it after, so you have the before and the after with respect to crime. But you cannot lock up people in the country. So every story they come out, the crime is because Kamala did not support and the opposition did, so, did not support the baby. You hear a lie? That is a big, big, fat lie. They said we did not support the bail bill provisions that we had passed and they had supported in 2014. They repeat, the Prime Minister repeated that today again. He says, um, didn't support this bail bill. It was in their bail bill 2014 and we who were then in opposition, we supported it. I am telling you, the opposition supported the bail bill in the parliament. I want you to recall what happened when they brought it. We said, we do not agree with this provision. If you amend it, we will agree and we'll pass it with a special majority. They didn't bother with us. It failed, 
and they went back. You know what I did? I wrote to the Prime Minister and I said, we are prepared to support this. We are prepared to waive the standing orders and say, bring it back within the same session. Because standing order says you can't bring out a bill that has failed in the same. I said, we will agree to waive the standing order, bring it back, put the amendment, and we will pass it. And we did that. We passed it. And what it was that if you committed certain offenses, yes, you could not get bail for 120 days. That's what we passed, and that's what we had. So a person charged with a, it is a law that the person who is charged with a firearm offense can, can be denied bail for 120 days. That's the same law we passed in 2014. If a person has been charged with a firearm offense and has a pending matter or a previous conviction, so in other words, like a two-time offender, you will be denied bail. We passed that. That is what we had in 2014, and we agreed. They agreed to the amendment, and we passed it. If a person is found committing a specific offense or a scheduled offense with the use of a firearm, he will be denied bail for 120. So don't lie to the population and use this bail bill blame game story over and over and over up to today. The AG up to yesterday is Teochong every day. It's a song they sing, a chorus that they keep singing, which is a lie. And so what we did not support, what we did not support was a denial of bail for 120 days for first-time offenders. You know why? If you're just an offender, you haven't been found guilty. Remember the cocaine and whatever, and the gun in Sadiq Bank um, water tank? You remember that? Remember that? They could plant things on an innocent citizen. They could plant it, they could pelt the gun in your yard and come back and find it right there, and you didn't even know it was there in the first place. So how can you deny someone that right to bail on a first-time charge? And we did not support that because we do not trust this government. We do not trust them. So it is a lie, as I say, to say that the opposition did not support the bail bill. There was one aspect they came back with a third time, supported it two previous times. We did not support that third time. Remember that. So is it the policy of this government to lock up everybody? Is that their way of dealing with crime, that you try to lock up everyone? The government I will form, our policy will be to tackle crime, as I say, as a social issue. You cannot lock up everybody to solve crime. You must not and you should not just be giving handouts. You have to give a hand up. So this handout thing, you come in and COVID, COVID is the biggest excuse for them. They're doing so well at COVID because all they could give is a food card and a hamper and they keep begging for this food card and a hamper. I mean, it's degrading to people. And those who have applied, they still cannot get it. They are reefed right. They cannot, people are suffering. But they sit up every day in the parliament and on the TV and on the radio, boasting how much money they're spending. And yet you and ordinary people can't see the money or feel that money or benefit from that money. The country is burning. His biggest plan is to form this committee. Now, I have no disrespect for the members of the committee. But I want to tell you, Dr. Rory, you are too late. You are too late. When we were in government, we commissioned a report from Dr. Selwyn Ryan. Selwyn Ryan, Dr. Selwyn, distinguished Dr. Selwyn Ryan, to, to do a survey, do a study for us to deal with the issue of crime and of youths <clears throat> and social issues. A very comprehensive study was done with Dr. Ryan's team. It was about 437 pages long. We have the study. The work is done is about implementing what is there. So why are you going to, you said today you did not want to, I heard him saying that, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Dr. Ryan's study is there. We started to implement it. You could pick that up, dust it out, and get to work. The work that you failed to do for five years, now coming like a hypocrite, crying crocodile tears today to blame everybody else except yourself and your incompetent government. I'm saying that is why the policy of my government was to invest in youth and young people so that they can have sustainable jobs. We dealt with the importance of sports. I only believe speaking of sports today and the use of lack of facilities in a place where we have great athletes coming. And I'm here in Taka talking about for point great cultural and sporting personalities. You see what that means? From the top of the northeast of Trinidad Tobago down to the southwest of Trinidad Tobago. And if you go across, it'll be 
northwest, and of course the um, south, south, we have south, southwest, and so in all over Trinidad and Tobago, we have tremendous talent. Our greatest resource has been and will always be our human resource. Again, we try to take care of the youths. We ensured so many programs, I mentioned them before, that this government has shut down. And then you want to cry these crocodile tears, but what wrong with these people? And what I'm going to do? And then he talked today, I did this, I did that. I had a project with 25 schools, and we came and we gave them Jersey. I don't even say Jersey or Jersey, you know, trees talk sometimes. He said we gave them these Jerseys, and we did certain things. Well, you do all of that. And you come in and you say, well, he said, I'll, I'll reinitiate some of the initiatives. We need to go back and do the same old, same old, same old. It didn't work. And you are saying, you're going back and do that again. Will you never learn? Will you never learn while people continue to suffer in Trinidad and Tobago? So that's what their plan is, is their COVID recovery plan. The other one is to do another study, another recovery of Port of Spain, I think he called it, with his committee. Then I don't want to spend a few moments because in Parliament on um, yesterday, Wednesday, the Prime Minister came with his master plan, but he didn't call it that. He called it the COVID recovery plan. I call it the COVID recovery election manifesto masquerading as a plan, using public money to write a very bad, and I have no disrespect for the members who did that committee, a very bad plan. Their first report, Roadmap for Recovery, I'm going to share with you and compare it to our master plan. Because that's where the answer is. The answer is in creating sustainable jobs. The answer is in building the economy. That's what people want. They want sustainable jobs. When they get these jobs, they must also get, be able to earn the money to build the complexes we speak about, to build community centers, to all the infrastructure that people are crying out for. How is it in 2020 people cannot get water? Everywhere in this country, no water, no water. And you have a, a minister of public utilities. They fired him once, then they hired up the other one from Ghana, and then he left, and they hired back the same man. The man they fired, Heinz, they hired him again. And people can't get water in this country. People can't get water. People complain about their roads, the infrastructure is so bad everywhere. So what do we have to do? We have to transform the economy to create the sustainable jobs. We have to transform the economy in order to make the money to put the infrastructure and the development into place. And that's what our plan seeks to do. So let me do a little comparison as quickly as I can. First of all, guiding principles. The PNM plan has no guiding principles. The UNC master plan has five interconnected guiding principles which constitute our strategy for recovery, growth, and diversification. One of those is people-centered development. And if you go on to UNC um, plan, 2020.com, you'll get the details because I don't want to spend all my time um, without getting to all the points with respect to the plan. So first, they have no guiding principles. The UNC plan has five guiding principles. Objectives, the PNM plan proposes four objectives. Social protection, leave no one behind. Doesn't that sound very familiar? Leave no one behind. That was a mantra of the People's Partnership, 2010-2015. Further, they're saying retain and create jobs, boost aggregate demand, and minimize and remediate supply disruptions. But these objectives are not smart objectives. It makes it very difficult to evaluate the success of the roadmap to attain these goals. So they're just words, it's just rhetoric, song in good boy, song in real good. But where are the specifics, where are the details? We have two objectives, inter alien, UNC plan. 50,000 jobs in five years. That is something you can evaluate. When you say about retain and create jobs, you have no target, you have no specific. Boost aggregate demand, what does that mean? Sounds good, that's p and Here it is, 50,000 jobs in five years, UNC. Doubling non-energy exports to US $5 billion. So you're clear what it is we want to do. 
doubling non-energy exports to US $5 billion. These are smart objectives. They are specific, they are measurable, they are attainable, they are realistic, and they are time-bound objectives. This makes it easier to evaluate the success of the master plan in reaching these desired objectives. Each sector, we also have smart targets related to job creation, related to forex earnings, related to foreign direct investment inflows, and they are aligned to the UN Sustainable Development Goal, the SDGs, and the Global Framework for Reducing Poverty. Again, UNC Plan 2020.com for more details on our objectives and the smart targets that we've set. PNM, Diagnosis of the Macroeconomic Context. Their diagnosis is very weak of the macro context, which is reflected in vague and general policy prescriptions. They suggest that Trinidad economy was Trinidad and Tobago economy was on the road to recovery before the COVID crisis. You hear lie? That is lie too. Road to recovery, Imbut in the parliament, dancing, song and dance. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. The economy is on a turnaround, all those lies. They say, it's far from the truth I am saying, when you look at the stats, lies again. They present some data on the impact of COVID-19 on Trinidad and Tobago economy and public spending profile, but there's no or little analysis of the efficiency of these measures. Let's contrast that to the UNC Master Plan. We provide a proper diagnosis of the macro context which sets the stage for the, for the suite of policy prescriptions to steer the economy towards a more sustainable development path over 2020 and to 2025. Our master plan was written before the eruption of the COVID-19 pandemic, but our policy framework with a focus on lower taxation, food security, technology, and climate change remotes, remains most relevant post-pandemic world. Immediate, and immediate policy actions, BNM. It is unclear as to what specific policies they will undertake in the short term to the end of September 2020 or even to December 2020. Our plan provides a range of policy actions that will be undertaken in the first 90 days of the UNC assuming office. Last week I started to name some of the parts of the 90 day plan. It's, there are numerous initiatives in there again uncplan2020.com for some more details. And as we continue to speak with you, we, we roll out the details. We'll have speakers taking parts of this and rolling out the details. Our plan, range of actions in our first 90 days. They have nothing specific that they will do between now and September or even from September thereafter. Stabilization policy. We have to stabilize the economy. Their plan place continued emphasis on heavy public spending, which may provide short-term relief, and that's all the, the grants that they will give, and the food cars and all the other bribes they want to give, provide some short-term relief to citizens and businesses, but this does not protect the deteriorating external position, widening our fiscal deficit, and rising public debt. They have borrowed and borrowed and borrowed and spent, 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 and want to tax, tax, tax. In our plan, we have outlined a well-coordinated mix of fiscal, monetary, and exchange rate actions to stabilize our economy. Our stabiliz stabilization policy framework seeks to protect and build up our external reserves, stabilize public debt, and balance the budget. These are very important for those of you who are into the economy and understand what is happening. If we can't get this done, we'll continue to crumble and fall. We have smart fiscal targets and smart monetary targets to guide our policy implementation and to foster business confidence. And you ask me what I mean by smart. Smart is we have clear objectives, clear targets, and then we can evaluate and measure as we go along the timeline to see where we've reached, where we need to go. So these are smart uh, policies and targets that we have. Diversification, that's a bad word to this government. Diversification. This is totally absent throughout the roadmap report, except for a very brief discussion on agriculture and construction, 
that's the PNM, but this is done in the context of mainly supporting aggregate demand, not pushing out the productive supply front of curve. What does that mean? It is saying that we have to pr produce more food, yeah, because people have to eat. But it's not about going beyond what people have to eat, but they don't speak about how we export that, how we make money from that, how we gain foreign exchange. As I say again, the diversification plan is very bare. And for us, diversification is the heart of our master plan. Let us understand that. It is the heart of our master plan. Because the energy sector has collapsed, not just here, but everywhere else. We had all our eggs in this one energy basket. Production has fallen. I see the Prime Minister saying that um, the energy sector is better off now than when they came into government. Listen, man, who are you fooling? Who are you trying to fool? Seven plants up in Point Lisa shut down. The production levels are at the all-time low. The prices are, you have shock output, and you have price shocks as well. So output shocks mean in production down, and price shocks, prices gone. So we have to diversify or die. If we don't diversify this economy, we will die. And that is the heart of our plan. What these do is to encourage strategic investments in niche non-energy sectors in which we have a very strong competitive advantage, in which we have market opportunity, in which we have growth potential. And we identify 12 prosperity engines with large multiplier effects spread across communities which will mobilize private sector investment and create jobs. So when I say we have competitive advantage, look, we have one of the best, um, the climate, in the world. We are located geographically, ideally here, as a gateway to the Americas. The Americas has about 160 million people as a market that we can sell things to and make money. And when we make money, we could pay, create jobs, we could pay workers. When we make money, we could build schools and roads and hospitals and sporting complexes and the other things these young people are talking about that we need in our communities. That's what competitive advantage is about having factors that make you better off in your place than another place. So a lot of people have sun, sea, and sun. A lot of the countries right in the Caribbean, many of them much better sun, sea, and sun than we could ever have for tourism. I mean, one of the game changers the government had was the, um, the hotel um, in, in Tobago. Sandals, sandals. But really, we would have been competing with the sun, sea, and sand everywhere else. What we were looking and what we had started to do is to create tourism in different areas. So the hospital in Kuva, hospital in Rima, the one in Point Fourteen, the San Fernando Teaching Hospital, these were the things we were building and some of them completed. This was for medical tourism. So others will come here and pay money for an exchange, again create jobs. Kuva Hospital was to create over 2,000 jobs. 2,000 jobs at every level, create jobs, earn foreign exchange, earn money to build road and bridge and other infrastructure, pay workers. So we were looking at the medical tourism, which we will continue so to do. We were looking at educational tourism. So that South Campus wasn't a build down there because Kamala from South, you know. When we started that, they said, what? Quarrel in the parliament. Kamala only building that down there. That's all she cares about. That was to clear up spaces up in the St. Augustine campus. Instead of people coming from Point Fourteen and Mayaro and all from the Deep South to go up to St. Augustine, we cleared those spaces would be people from the East West Corridor and Border Spain. Easy for them to go there, so you have more spaces open up. And this would have been down here for the South. In that way, education. Education, I tell you, passport out of poverty. The only key to a better way of life, education. That's what that was for. But you know what it was also for? Educational tourism. So people could have come more spaces, would have come from the other CARICOM nations to come right here and do what? Spend money, pay money, create shops, buy food, rent place to stay. And not just here, as I said, when it's freed up spaces up on the Santa Cruz campus, more students could have come there too. It would have spread spread, spread, and create more income for Trinidad and Tobago. So diversity, I'll give you two, um, two possibilities we had started and we were going to look and continue. 
And of course, we have a major plank in agriculture. I spoke about that several times. I will not go back there. But we have other diversification strategies. We have, I was checking, not checking, I go on the internet and you look at the things. And I was very curious about peppers. I spoke about pepper last week. I told you about my peppers last week, see some trouble. And several people sent me some prescriptions. So can I say thank you all? I'm trying those. I hope they work better with pepper. We have two of the most, the, of the hottest peppers in the world, two in the top 10 list. Dong Moruga, what is it called? Scorpion, scorpion, but there's a seven pot pepper and scorpion pepper. That's something we have a tremendous comparative advantage. You know what it makes me think about? It's the same way we have the Trinitario cocoa, which is one of the highest quality cocos in the world for people making chocolate. So they will buy ours at a high price and when they do that, they just take a little bit of ours and mix it in a lower quality um, cocoa to make the chocolate. In the same way with these high quality peppers we have, we, we can export it, make money again. Making money, what do we do? Fix roads, bridges, drains, take care of people, look after the poor, and so on. So we have a lot of things we can do in this country. Someone sent me when they heard me talking about agriculture, they said, what a coffee? We had to have a coffee. I said, yes, we'll talk about that too. So we have a lot that we can do for diversification. As I said, we have the prosperity engines, um, Brechen Kasser, agro-processing complex. So if we are planting a lot agriculture, we have to process it. Otherwise, when you get a big crop, it goes bad. You can process. We have the sugar manufacturing facility. This is very important for the corridor, East-West Biotechnology Manufacturing Corridor. East-West Biotechnology Manufacturing Corridor. There's so many things that we can make right here that we don't have to import. I talked about things like just gloves, gloves for hospitals and so on. A lot of things, again, the plan, UNC plan, 2020.com. A digital innovation park, we are in the digital age. That's one of the prosperity engines. A Tamana Solar Tech Renewable Energy Park. We must get into renewable energy. A West Port of Spain, Trinidad Creative Arts Street Area. East Port of Spain <clears throat> Steel Pan Manufacturing Facility, Piaco Aircraft Maintenance Repair and Operations Hub, Cedras Special Economic Zone, Point Galeota Energy Logistics Hub, Plymouth International Cruise Ship Marina Complex, Tobago's first locally branded hospital. These are some of our prosperity engines to kickstart the economy, to make money again. Why do you want to make money? to take care of the needs of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. In agriculture, we have a specific smart plan, a stimulus package of 500 million. I'm sorry, the PNM's agricultural plan, they asked for an agricultural stimulus package of 500 million. But again, no smart plan, no specific actions to be taken to create a food secure nation. This is a one thing on agriculture. For us, agriculture and food security, central to the master plan. We single out agriculture, do its strong potential to reduce the high food import bill, to generate foreign exchange, to create jobs, and to manage the fight against climate change. We outline over 20 specific detailed initiatives to jumpstart agriculture and food security. Again, UNC plan, 2020.com. Some of these include a lease of 25,000 acres of farm, former carrying lands to set up agricultural parks. Devoted at least 10% of the PSIP of the budget to support agricultural infrastructure. Establishment of an organic sugar manufacturing facility. Establishment of an agro-processing complex. Again, for diversification, digital economy. Fourth Industrial Revolution, this is where we have to go. The PNM's recovery plan, they talk about the building of a digital nation, but again, this is mainly restricted to improving the ease of doing business. Our plan recognizes the technologies of the Fourth Industrial Revolution can give TT a better chance to speed up modernization of the economy. We advocate for our own local model of what is known as a classic Triple Helix, university, private sector, and government to leapfrog into the fourth industrial revolution. We outline five specific detailed initiatives to build out the digital economy. 
These include raising research and development, spending 1% of GDP, and the establishment of a digital innovation park. And we recommend also the creation of a national digital ID program and a national e-payment platform for government services. So you will ask me now, you want to do all of this, you want to do it, how, how are you going to do it? Where are you going to get the money from? You say you're going to lower income taxes, corporate taxes. So where are you going to get this money from? Let me tell you why. The PNM's financing strategy is as follows. That's their recovery plan. They place a heavy reliance on further public borrowing, as well as the sale of the PICO traditional portfolio. Where are they going to get money for their COVID recovery? Borrow, borrow, borrow. But you know what? Fire sales to sell assets of the government. They have no plan as to where the money is to come from, except to borrow, 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 tax, tax, tax. And as I said, um, <clears throat> so sales, fire sales. They're going to sell out the Kiko traditional portfolio. It's in their plan. It's in black and white. I'm not making this up. In fact, they're going to identify specifics of what it is um, they're going to sell. Now, we are proposing, in addition to scaling up traditional sources of finance, our plan calls for the creation of three innovative funds a national food security fund, a national infrastructure fund, and a national climate trust fund to finance activities and projects from our master plan. These three new funds, I want to repeat, I want to repeat, I want to, will not increase public debt, will not increase debt. The first one, the infrastructure construction fund, recommends, as I say, I'm sorry, give me a minute. Infrastructure and construction. I talked to a financing strategy with its three funds. Again, uncplan2020.com for more details. COVID recovery from the PNM. Infrastructure construction. What do you talk about? They recommend the creation of a high level committee. Reporting to whom? The Prime Minister to develop a detailed plan for the construction sector. So, you know, guess what? No plan. No plan. They have to set up a committee. Five years you're there, you're not going to set up committee when you're on your way out. Not going to happen. For us, infrastructure is a main pillar of the plan. We recognize the ability to connect people, places, and communities, as well as spread income, wealth, and development across the land. We recognize the importance of construction in stimulating demand, but we recommend the creation of a high-level committee reported to the Prime Minister to develop a detailed plan for the construction sector. This is not my plan, that is theirs. Reporting to the Prime Minister of some committee reporting and so on. We outline three, sorry, we, we have seven specific detailed initiatives to strengthen infrastructure capacity. So um, please uh, forgive me if I misspoke there. This committee for the Prime Minister and so on, that's the PNM. We have seven specific initiatives, and more will come from each of the constituencies as we continue to work out. These include the creation of a Southwest Peninsula Economic Zone, Lincoln Cedrus to Maruga, the creation of a Southeast Peninsula Economic Zone, linking Manzana to Mayaro, the establishment of aircraft maintenance, repair, and operations hub at Piarco, and of course, the Northeast linkages that we will make from Middle Corridor, right up to Toko Sandy Grandi. So these are some of the initiatives that we have. I wanted to give you the comparison of their plan versus ours, because their plan, as I say, is very generalized, very generic, no smart targets, and no specifics for implementation. The choice is yours. You can get more details. We we'll rule it out as we go along. Now, I do have more to speak about for tonight in terms of our investing in the youth in education, in job creation, restoring trust in the police service, strengthening national security, equipping the police, and uh, bail reform. These are some of the things that UNC can do to address crime in our country. So I think I can do that on another evening. We've talked a lot for tonight. Um, I just want to say as I close that <clears throat> the time is now. Now is the time. The choice is very, very clear. We have survived barely for the past almost five years. 
Can we afford another five years? That's the question of the PNM. Can we afford another five years? They have failed in every aspect of governance. In a few months, you, the people, will make a choice for your future and for future generations. While we keep that fire of hope in our hearts that better days are ahead, we can only achieve our shared goal of a brighter, more prosperous future if we work together. Now more than ever, we must draw on our courage. We must draw on our resilience. We must draw on our innovative spirit to meet the challenges head on. We are ready to build on the work done during the government I led to move TNT forward. And how will we do it? We'll invest in education and health. We'll focus on the environment to create better business growth and job creation. And we'll work for restoring a safer and more secure place for all. The UNC has been and will continue to meet with people to hear their concerns and develop workable solutions to address some of the problems that we face. I will tell you we are the only political party that puts people at the center of our policies, our plans, and our proposals. We are the only people, as I say, as our guiding principle, one of them, people-centered development. I know many are crying out for change, but that change can only come if, as I say, we work together. I am proud to see our candidates on the ground. It has been very exciting, check on all the videos and the photos, and getting the feedback from the various constituencies. The UNC is on the ground. The UNC is creating an excitement. This UNC is clear to me that we are going to win the next election. So what? The time is now. Now is the time. Are you ready for that change in Trinidad and Tobago? I want to thank you all, to all the hardworking UNC family members, the candidates, the campaign managers, the coordinators, the counselors. We have a tremendous team, tremendous family on the gong. And I look forward, as I say always, to seeing you again. You know, someone reminded me last night that sometimes I used to say at the end of my speech, and they that I'm not saying it again. Maybe it's because of the COVID and we're not getting to meet that we are locked down and we, we don't meet and we can't feel it so much. But I'll repeat what I say many times. You have had other leaders before me. You will have other leaders after me. But I know you will never ever have a leader who loves you as much as I do. God bless you and I thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Good night.